Today is December 4th, 2015. I'm Joe McMaster, and as part of the MIT Infinite History Project, we're talking with Dr. Faribors Massey. An engineer and mathematician by training, Dr. Massey is a pioneer in the field of micro-electromechanical systems, an investor, a technology entrepreneur, and a venture uh, philanthropist. Born in Iran, Dr. Massey came to the United States at 18. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering and a Master of Science degree in Applied Mathematics from Portland State University and a Master's of Science degree in Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. He holds a Doctor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from MIT. Shortly after finishing his doctorate in 1990, he founded IntelliSense, the first company focused on the custom design, development, and manufacturing of next generation MEMS or MEMS devices. In 2001, he founded the Messiah Foundation, dedicated to the concept of venture phila philanthropy. And he's also the founder of a successful wealth management firm. Dr. Massey's philanthropic impact on the life, campus, and culture of MIT has been profound. He currently sits on the MIT School of Engineering Dean's Advisory Council and has been a member of the MIT Corporation since 2012. Welcome. Thanks for talking with us today. Thank you for having me. So I think if, if we could begin, I'd, I'd love to, to talk about uh, your, your path that brought you to MIT. And uh, as we just mentioned, you were, you were from Iran originally. So. Yes. Well, uh, I was born in Tehran, Iran. Um, and uh, I come from a business-oriented family. Uh, my uh, grandparents, uh, my paternal grandfather, was in tobacco business. He uh, manufactured uh, cigarettes, and uh, uh, we, he was distributing cigarettes at that time. Uh, and my maternal grandfather was in sugar business, and he had a large proprietorship of sugar. They were uh, business neighbors. Uh, their factories were next to each other, and so they used to see each other every day. And that's how my mom and my dad met. And that's how I was born, uh, subsequently. And um, so I lived in Tehran uh, for about 17 years and um, went to school, uh, finished high school. And I, when I look back, I was never um, particularly a very, very good student. Uh, I was always in the top quartile or the top decile, but I was never the best. My dad, who was an electrical engineer, uh, when I was about 10, 11 years old, uh, he uh, talked about this school uh, in America called MIT. And that's all I could remember at the time. Uh, he said that that's an excellent school uh, to go to if you want to become an engineer. I didn't even know what MIT stand, standard for, but, but I knew that it, there was a school and it was good. As I grew up um, uh, and finished high school, um, I decided to uh, go to university uh, subsequent to that uh, in Tehran, Iran. I have to say that I am more of a clutch player, uh, being uh, when the heat is on, uh, I perform well. So as I mentioned, I was never uh, an extremely good student, but I performed really well uh, in the national exam. And I think I was in the top 50 uh, amongst 300,000 students uh, that participated in the national exam. So that gave me a ticket to go to any university or any major that I wanted uh, in, in, in Tehran at that time. So I decided to go to the best school, uh, and at that time, uh, the, the best major or toughest one to get into was civil engineering at the University of Tehran, and that is what I decided, uh, just because that was the hardest one to get in. Uh, so no particular reason uh, for me uh, uh, to be engineer uh, or civil engineer otherwise. As I uh, started uh, the University of Tehran, this is 1977 now, uh, and, uh, or the beginning of the 1977, 
the majority of the time, uh, the university was either uh, closed or half open, and the classes were canceled. So I figured it's going to take me a very long time uh, for me to uh, get a degree here. And uh, uh, Iran at the time had this uh, restriction that, you know, uh, if you turn 18 and if you're not going to a university, there is a mandatory military service that you have to go to. So I decided to frantically uh, look for uh, university admission uh, to uh, leave Iran and uh, not to be qualified for that mandatory military service. And I applied to a lot of universities, some famous, some not so famous. The first one that gave me admission uh, was Portland State University. Uh, I think I got that admission within two or three weeks after applying. They actually telexed it to an agent they had uh, in Tehran, and I picked up the telex. Um, I basically went the next day to uh, the U.S. Embassy with my passport. They stamped a visa on my passport. And, um, and I didn't tell my family, obviously, that I'm doing this because my family didn't want me to leave. And so I borrowed money from my uncle and bought an airplane ticket and uh, uh, went the night to my dad and I said, Here's my passport, here's my uh, university admission, and here's my tickets. Um, I'm going to leave in about two or three days, and he was not very happy. So he came around after a couple of days, and, um, you know, uh, uh, and a few days later, um, I was in Portland, Oregon, on a rainy Saturday day um, in March of 1977. So that's how I came to America, and that's how I ended up in Portland State University. That's, that's fascinating. Did you did you have an interest in uh, in math and science uh, as a kid, even though you say you weren't uh, always a, a strong student? So. Yes. Uh, so my my interest was mostly uh, towards engineering and sciences rather than humanities, uh, and. So I, I was more comfortable studying engineering, for example, than being a, a medical doctor or being a lawyer. Uh, though those were also very popular majors uh, at the time. So, you, so it's uh, so so Portland State it was just the first one that uh, that happened to accept you, and the off first, you went. The, yeah, I was in a rush to go. Portland State gave me the fastest admission, and I basically was on my way over. Uh, because of that, it sounds must have been. Was it a, a difficult uh, thing to 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 do to to leave family and home and all of that? Uh, you know, when you are young and you are seventeen, eighteen years old, um, you uh, really don't have as many fears uh, as when you are um, older. Uh, I was concerned, uh, but I was not really that afraid. Uh, to travel by myself, and I actually was looking forward to that, uh, to see if I can actually live independently, uh, rather than being in the household of, of my parents. So actually, I welcomed that uh, opportunity. And uh, But then when I came to Portland, I started acclimating with um, uh, the new university life which is a lot more organized than, you know, where it was when I was in Iran. And then I decided to, uh, the, uh, you know, study as fast as possible so, so that I can remedy some of the time that I've lost uh, when I was in Tehran and the universities were closed. And then this is 1979 that the Iranian revolution actually did happen. And, um, and, and then my family, including my sisters and my mom, uh, basically uh, immigrated uh, from uh, Iran, and they all came to Portland uh, because I was uh, in Portland, Oregon. And, and that's how we basically all uh, ended up in Portland, Oregon. 
And is, do you still have uh, some family members in Portland then? Or? Virtually all my family lives in Portland, Oregon. So my mom and dad and my sisters, uh, they all live and with their family and, you know, children, they all live in Portland, Oregon. Right, right. Yeah. So what were your, your, your goals when you, uh, when you went to Portland State? I mean, you mentioned it, you, were, you were there to study civil engineering, I guess. Is that yep. right? Or? Well, I, since I started as a, as a civil engineer in, in, in Tehran, uh, naturally I went and studied civil engineering uh, in, in, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, at the time, Iran was booming with construction and, you know, being a civil engineer and being in construction. Uh, was a very um, uh, valuable uh, degree to have uh, so that you could participate in that booming economy. Uh, when we came to Portland, I just wanted to continue that uh, because, uh, uh, you know, at the time that I arrived, actually uh, the uh, relationships and, uh, between the United States and Iran were fairly normal. Everything was calm and quiet. And, uh, and I was determined to finish the same degree and probably go back. When the revolution happened, um, I decided to finish as fast as possible and go get a job um, that I could uh, in, in, in the United States. So I finished in about three years. And, uh, and this is now 1980, which was another recession era. Uh, in the United States, and I, as I finished, and I was, uh, as I was looking for a job, obviously the job market was not as abundant uh, as I had expected, so I couldn't get a job. Uh, and uh, so rather than basically uh, uh, doing nothing, and I couldn't go back home anymore, so I started uh, studying um, a, a, in a graduate school, and I went to University of Texas at Austin, and um, started a master's degree over there. Um, after uh, a year and a half, I took all my courses, and I was almost finished when my dad, who was stuck in Tehran, Iran, uh, uh, he finally could come over. And, um, and he came to visit me in Austin. And when I looked at him, uh, you know, his hair was so white and, you know, he looked a lot different than a few years ago when I left him. And at that time, I felt that maybe I should just leave this thesis that I had um, and, and go back to Portland and, and help him out. And I thought that I could basically write my thesis just remotely and just submit it. And uh, UT Austin was okay with that. So, um, uh, so I decided to go back to Portland, Oregon with them. And so you, so you went back and, and started another degree in Portland at some point, correct? Yeah, so uh, I, when I went back, uh, it was mainly to uh, go help my dad out. Uh, uh, and uh, he came to a new country, and uh, he, uh, you know, we, we were from a well-to-do family, and when the revolution happened, we uh, uh, all of a sudden became poor. Uh, they, um, uh, most of his assets were confiscated or frozen, and uh, he uh, couldn't get out for a while. So when he finally could come out, I decided to go and help him. So that's why I uh, followed him to Portland. And, uh, and I was there for about, uh, I would say, about three years. And uh, I started my first company. Uh, I think I was 22 or 23 at that time. And that was a auto dealership company. Uh, we um, uh, started a auto dealership. And, um, and that actually became a uh, viable, profitable uh, a company uh, after two or three years. Um, and uh, my dad started he had, uh, some real estate developments uh, in Portland. And uh, meanwhile, I also went back to Portland State and got another master's degree in math. So within the three years that I was in Portland, Oregon, I felt like my family situation 
is uh, stabilized. And, uh, and I received another degree, and you know, I thought that now I can leave again and uh, go back to what I wanted to pursue. Now, at that time, since I had, every time I graduated, you know, the economy was not good, um, uh, I, I decided to get a job. So I applied uh, for this job in Chicago, uh, and um, I, I, I got this job that was a wonderful job. Uh, it was in a uh, construction company. Uh, they were building nuclear power plants, and um, and you know uh, became one of the engineers that they hired. But prior to that, uh, going to that job, and this is I think now we are talking about uh, the 1985. Um, a couple months before I received uh, the job offer uh, in, in somewhere in April or probably beginning of May, May, I actually sent application to MIT uh, for a doctoral degree. But I was almost 100% uh, certain uh, that um, I, I would not get accepted because A, I applied too very late, and B, I was probably not qualified uh, to be admitted to MIT. I never went to a uh, name brand school. Um, I mean, I went to University of Texas, but I didn't have a degree because I never finished. Uh, never submitted my um, uh, thesis. So, um, uh, so I was 100% uh, certain that I couldn't get um, a, an admission from MIT. As I was uh, preparing to leave for Chicago for uh, my job in this company called Sargent and Lundy, um, you know, I got this mail um, uh, from MIT, and um, and it was in a thin um, a white envelope, um, and I had seen those before. Uh, I was for certain that it starts with uh, the letters, we regret to inform you something. And so I didn't even open it. Um, and, uh, and it was in my car for a couple days till I was driving with a friend of mine, and he pointed out and said, well, don't you want to open this? And I said, well, I already know what it says. So he said, well, can I open it? And I said, yeah, go ahead and open it. Um, uh, and he opened it, and uh, he remained very quiet. Um, and uh, he just uh, handed it to me. And, um, and I couldn't believe it. It started with uh, congratulations. And uh, so now, uh, two days before, you know, leaving for my first real job, um, I get this miracle admission from MIT uh, for a doctoral program. And, um, and, and that was like a big paradox. Uh, I mean, I read that letter a few times to make sure that this is, you know, really me or, you know, there's no mistake. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, um, you know, um, so that was a tough one or two days for me to decide whether to still go to that job or wait and go uh, to school in September. So I decided to go to the job and see how it goes. Um, and if it didn't go well, then I would basically go from Chicago to Boston uh, and go to MIT. And um, so uh, the job was wonderful. Chicago is really a nice city. I started having really good friends. Uh, Chicago, I was young, yeah, and Chicago has great things to offer. Um, and the job was so easy. Uh, it was almost like paperwork. So the job was um, uh, pretty easy. We uh, was pretty well paid uh, in comparison of my other jobs that I had in the past, and, um, and I was having a wonderful time. 
What happened is after seven months of having really wonderful times, I got really, really tired. Uh, because, like I said, the jo job was not very, con you know, contentful. And, um, and, and then I decided to now go to MIT. So I called MIT up and I said, look, I am such and such. And, you know, they said, well, uh, you know, do you have a letter? And I said, such and such. And, you know, they went and checked. And, um, they became very angry. They said, well, you know, we admitted you for September. You didn't show up. You didn't tell us that you don't show up. We don't know if we can readmit you anymore. Uh, and so that was a big shock. Uh, and now I got stuck with this job that, you know, it, it, it was a not a very engaging job. Uh, I wasn't learning much. Uh, I was having a ton of fun, uh, but, um, uh, and I lost this golden opportunity that I was uh, always wishing for. So I decided to uh, quit the job, put everything that I had in my car, uh, sold everything else that I had, and I drove from uh, uh, Chicago to Boston in mid-January of 1986. And that was an interesting trip in itself. It was uh, snowing, uh, you know, for the couple of days that I was driving. So uh, I had some exciting moments. Um, and I arrived in Boston for the first time, uh, found this school, and um, went and, you know, told them, look, I'm here. You know, I'm going to be here anyways. Uh, and, uh, you know, they readmitted me. Um, and, but they told me that, you know, we admit you, um, uh, but we can't offer you any more um, student aids or we don't even have a dorm for you uh, to be in. Those all took care of themselves. Uh, in a few weeks, um, I received a teaching assistant and, you know, they gave me a dorm. And, and, and you know, from then on, uh, I was, uh, a, you know, uh, I was pretty well settled uh, as a student. Now, when I first started, I reaffirmed this doubt that I had that, you know, they probably admitted me by mistake. Um, you know, uh, never felt like I was good enough to compete because the, the kids here are really, really smart. Um, at a different level, and they were trained differently. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, uh, I started civil engineering uh, in the winter semester, and, um, uh, you know, I did okay with my tests and all that. Uh, not, again, uh, the best, but, you know, somewhere in the middle average. Um, and then came summer, um, I, and I got this job at Microsystems Technology Laboratory uh, in Building 36. That was a summer job for a couple of months. Uh, Steve Centuria, who was a professor at the time, um, he uh, gave me um, that summer job. And that started expose me, exposing me to the field of microelectromechanical systems. Uh, those are the very early times of the evolution of that uh, technology, and um, I was one of the early people uh, to be working on that. And uh, so after a couple months, uh, I guess he was very satisfied with my performance, and he asked me if I want to stay on as a graduate student and be um, a, a, a in his group and uh, uh, do uh, research on MEMS. And obviously I jumped at the opportunity and um, uh, so uh, that's how I started uh, in the field of MEMS, again accidentally by a summer job. And um, uh, three or four years later um, uh, I received, I think it was four years later that I received my PhD in there. Now, I have to tell you that, you know, I, when I told you that I, uh, when I came to MIT, I uh, felt dumb and, you know, 
comparison to the others. When I came uh, to then building 36, there I was the time that I felt really, really dumb. So uh, those guys uh, were so much smarter uh, than anybody else that I've seen. And, uh, uh, and I remember um, the group uh, that, you know, we were in uh, uh, and in the same building. Uh, I met Raphael Reif at the same time. Uh, Marty Schmidt was actually my uh, office mate and uh, Charlie Sudini, um, uh, Duane Bonning. Uh, these are some of the uh, now well-known professors uh, here uh, at MIT. Uh, uh, you know, that, that takes me back to those times being with those guys. So tell me, I mean, maybe you can tell me just a little bit about that field and yeah. what it is, but also what attracted you to it. Why did you, know, you stick with it if, you, <laughs> if it seemed even harder than... Uh, yeah. Well, the, the, the nice thing about MEMS is, as the name says, they are micro, uh, they are electro, and then they are mechanical systems. So micro is just smaller than, you know, the larger sizes. So, so that's not the scary part. The electro part was more scary for me than the mechanical part because I was being a civil engineering, uh, being a civil engineer and, you know, having trained through uh, mechanics and, and analysis of various microstructures or bigger structures. Uh, you just have to scale them down uh, to, to see what, you know, you can make with smaller scales. Uh, so uh, I actually had a pretty good uh, background on one part of it, which is the micromechanical part. And what I didn't have was the electronic part, which I uh, had to catch up and, you know, uh, learn from here. The other part that was fascinating, uh, which was uh, anybody's game, was the actual fabrication, because we used to actually macro fabricate these things uh, on wafers uh, ourselves. Uh, we didn't design and send these out. So I was in building 13 and uh, building 36, uh, and we were patterning and manufacturing these silicon wafers with our own hands. And, and that is mostly chemistry. Uh, so it's the, the wonderful part about it is uh, uh, th these MEMS uh, require the knowledge of material mechanics, analysis, electrical, uh, chemistry, uh, certainly physics, uh, uh, all combined. And, uh, and, and there is very little, um, uh, there are very few people that know all of them before they actually start in this field. Uh, so everybody brings something to the table, and as a group, uh, we could basically flourish by uh, sharing ideas and information. All right. Yeah. So 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 you so you switched uh, departments effectively, or switched? so I switched departments. I, I mean, I I I didn't want to restart uh, changing uh, my entire. Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 departments because then I had to take a lot of other courses and all that. But but virtually, uh, I stayed in the civil engineering department for four months, and then the rest of the four years I was in electrical engineering, uh, and I was in building 36 um, on the sixth floor. Okay. Remember it well. So I learned about that uh, uh, technology. Uh, I, I was strong with analytics. Uh, uh, I was strong with um, uh, some of the software uh, that is used to analyze and design different structures. And as I uh, uh, graduated, uh, those were my strong suits. Uh, you know, I you know, so. I, Got my PhD, and um, uh, I um, uh, didn't think about academia that much. Um, I was more of a business-oriented person, I think, from a family background and all that. So I um, had these offers uh, from uh, reputable larger companies, um, and I had an offer from a very unknown uh, company in Silicon Valley. And now we're talking about 19, um, 
90. And at, that, and at those times, startups were not as popular uh, as they are today. So, um, so everybody was impressed that I had these name brand offers from these other companies. But I decided to go uh, to Silicon Valley and take the job on that uh, smaller uh, unknown startup. And this was uh, in um, uh, an opposite of the advices that I received from everyone. I said, you have a now, uh, a, you have a doctoral degree from MIT um, going to this unknown place um, uh, with little funding. Um, is almost like a career suicide, and if what happens if it doesn't work, uh, uh, you uh, it will fail. And uh, but you know, as somehow that was my calling. You know, I uh, knew I, I I not fit for larger operations. Um, and I remember I graduated on June fourth um, here, um, and. Um, uh, so my parents came, and we went to commencement and all that. And on June 5th at, um, I think, 12 noon, I was at my job in this Silicon Valley uh, startup um, um, starting to work. So uh, uh, that's how I transitioned out of MIT to, uh, to the workforce. Now, um, I stayed in that. A uh, small company for about a year. Um, uh, after eight or nine months of being there, I felt that this company is not going to go anywhere or survive. So um, I quit my job um, a year after I started it. And then I decided that, um, look, uh, uh, this is my only opportunity to start my own company because um, uh, you know, as you become older, then, you know, it's harder to take a lot of risks. So, you know, I was still young enough that I could take a lot of risks. I didn't have any family or any responsibilities. And I, if I failed, I only failed uh, myself. So I went back to Boston and I started IntelliSense. And this is 1991 right now. Uh, now. And... Uh, uh, and uh, it was more of a consulting company. We were basically helping others uh, design and develop their MEMS devices. And, uh, and, and that's how uh, the company got started. Um, I was basically selling my time and intellectual resources to other companies and clients that wanted to develop a new product. And as as it is with Fragile or any companies, uh, you know, things go up and down. I, you know, in 1990, my salary was a lot. In 1991, uh, my salary was below poverty line. Uh, so I went from receiving a lot of money to basically barely surviving. But I was really super excited. Uh, and every day that I was going to you know, the job or, you know, my place of business, I was super excited. Two years later, we ran out of money. And I remember there was a day that I looked at my accounts. And this is literally, uh, uh, without any ag exaggeration, I had a few dollars uh, in each of them. I had a lot of credit card debts, and uh, so it was a dire situation. But I was okay with it because I thought that, okay, this is it. Uh, we failed. Uh, the, that is, I failed. And, uh, but I was happy that I had the opportunity to try. And so I decided that this is it. The business is closed. I'm going to call everybody, let them know uh, that, you know, I going to close my business. And one of the uh, places that I was calling was uh, Kirtland uh, Air Force Base. Um, uh, and uh, I think they are in, is that, they're in New Mexico, I think. Uh, uh, and I had previously submitted uh, a proposal to them, 
but this this was a government proposal. It takes a long time for them to process it and give you an answer and all that. But I just wanted to call them and tell them, look, you know, uh, closing the business and, you know, uh, they were still a month away for notifying us. And a woman picks up the phone and I tell her, look, I'm maybe closing my business. And I'd like to know if you can tell me if that proposal that I submitted was uh, uh, accepted or not because, you know, I may not be here when you actually send me the results. But I knew that the chances are one in ten because that is what the odds are uh, for these proposals to be funded. Uh, so I was giving it a very little chance. Uh, I, I was just basically curious at that time. So the woman uh, uh, says, look, uh, sir, uh, we cannot notify you. Uh, you have to wait till everybody else is notified at the same time. But I insisted. I said, look, you know, I'm closing my business. I got to know now uh, because, you know, I can't really wait. Uh, I won't be here. And, and she was, uh, I could hear that, you know, her voice, uh, she was annoyed, uh, basically, by me persisting and insisting. And she finally said, uh, uh, can you wait uh, a few minutes? And I said, yes, uh, I'll wait. And uh, a few minutes later, she, came, uh, she comes back and says, uh, sir, um, um, I checked, but as I told you, uh, we cannot notify you uh, of any decisions. Uh, it's against the rules. Uh, you have to wait till everybody else is informed at the same time. And I said, well, I am actually uh, closing my business uh, in about a week. And she almost became irritated and angry, said, uh, sir, I told you that I cannot tell you of our decision, but if it was to me, I'll wait. And that uh, few words basically uh, changed my life. Uh, the fact that she said, I'll wait, uh, uh, is all I needed. Uh, so uh, two weeks later, we received a notification letter that we received our first contract from them. After that, uh, I think it was uh, another two weeks later, we received another contract from someone else. And from that moment on, uh, we basically uh, uh, started to do well in a way that we doubled our business every year, except the last two years, which we were quadrupling our business uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, we became uh, a debt-free. Um, we built a manufacturing company. Um, I was lucky enough that I could retain the majority of ownership. And uh, I think uh, to date is uh, one of the most successful MEMS companies uh, that was ever uh, uh, created. Uh, the company was sold in uh, the June of 2000 uh, for $750 million uh, to Corning. And, uh, and, and that's how uh, the company started and uh, transacted out. <laughs> I love how there seems to be a it's recurring, um, <clears throat> well, taking of risks and, and uh, uh, it's, know. yeah, uh, you know, I, I uh, without getting into religiosities and all that, uh, I think there is um, um, some invisible forces of universe uh, that sometimes are at work and, um, and, and I believe in that. Yeah, 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 no, it's, uh, it's extraordinary. So, so, you, so you'd sold the company and done very well, and, and um, <clears throat> did you have a plan at that point, or did you just think, well, I'll figure out what's yeah. next? Yeah, so when I sold the company, I became uh, a, uh, a executive at this larger company that gave me a lot, actually, more responsibility than I had. Uh, uh, so not only I had to run my company, I had to run other sites for them. And uh, I, 
I, I remember that, uh, you know, I was just flying to all these sites and different places and all that, and this is at the telecom boom of um, 2000, 2001, and, um, uh, and, and then it became a bust uh, right at the end of uh, 2001. Uh, but but we are we were in the heat of it, um, and I remember uh, one day I got up in a hotel room um, and uh, I I was trying to figure out where I was um, and what I am supposed to do that day. Uh, like I, I knew I had to do something at like you know when I get up and uh, you know get ready. But I just couldn't figure out where I was. Uh, so I usually um, can tell by the area codes on the phone. So I looked at the area code on the phone um, of the hotel, and I couldn't figure it out. Um, uh, and so embarrassingly, I press zero, and the operator comes and says, look, you know, uh, this is, I'm not trying to be funny, but uh, uh, which city are we in? Uh, and I think she said Richardson, Texas, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and I, you know, started uh, reflecting on this, that how is it that I don't remember, uh, uh, you know, where I am and, you know, what I'm supposed to do? Um, you know, we were working so hard uh, and so much uh, that um, I never reflected back uh, about what is the meaning of all that, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 I mean, even after I sold my company, I was going, uh, uh, you know, with twice as much effort. Um, the, so uh, then I started, re you know, asking, well, what is the meaning of this? Uh, if I don't know where I am, or I mean, you know, I, I, I don't need any more wealth. I don't need any more resources. Why am I doing what I am doing? So I decided to step back, and that, that was another defining moment. Uh, you know, it's all the, about these inflection points of time in these moments uh, that uh, gives you uh, hints and answers. Uh, so I, uh, again, resigned, um, uh, and um, uh, got married, um, uh, you know, uh, decided to, um, uh, uh, moved to a new place. Uh, we left Boston. First, we went to New York. Um, but I thought New York is not necessarily a you know ideal place to raise a family. So we went to San Francisco. Wanted to be in a city. And then, um, uh, and then San Francisco, um, uh, wife didn't like it. So um, on our way to Los Angeles, we ended up. Uh, staying in Orange County, and, uh, and it's a nice place, and uh, I ended up in Orange County. I started my family office uh, and uh, retrained myself because um, uh, after my transactions, uh, we uh, exchanged stocks. And uh, again, the interesting part is uh, that when we exchanged stocks at those valuations, over the next months, uh, the stock actually doubled. So the valuation even doubled what the original transaction price was. I started learning, you know, what stocks are and, you know, uh, what are some of the trading and instruments and hedging and uh, uh, how do you protect yourself. And, and, and it was another fascinating um, uh, field for me. So I, I, I moved out of engineering, and I started training myself in finance. And, uh, and, and we are one of um, significant option traders right now uh, on the West Coast. Um, we also have a real estate, of, a real estate portfolio um, in our family office. And, uh, and I do some community services, philanthropic activities, and uh, um, so the life is probably as busy as before, uh, but with different activities. <clears throat> yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, so, so maybe we can talk about some of those other activities, actually. And, and specifically, you, you started a foundation at some point. Yeah. Um, 
maybe you can tell me about that and you know tell me about the foundation and what it is and what what led you to start that yeah well what led me to start that that's that's actually a very good question um before i actually became um uh wealthy through my sale of the company this is in 19 i would say 98 um I mean, I was doing okay. My business was, like I said, it was doubling, quadrupling. Uh, we were profitable. Um, and I had this assistant, and I uh, told her, look, you know, um, uh, I wish I was, was able to help someone. Uh, and she said, look, you know, I have an aunt that, is a, uh, uh, that works in Lawrence High School. And, uh, and that high school is not necessarily, you know, in a good shape. I think it was the only unaccredited high school in Massachusetts for a while. Uh, mostly immigrants and impoverished uh, uh, families and students. Um, so I, I decided to, you know, give a uh, financial aid or scholarship to whoever graduates from Lawrence High School, um, wanted to give it to one of them um, for one year. So that was my entree to philanthropic activities. When they brought me five or six of these um, applicants, and as you read their stories and all that, um, uh, uh, you know, that really impacted me. That, you know, I thought, you know, my life had a lot of ups and downs and all that. Uh, but, but then when you reflect on somebody else's life, you would see that there are a lot of people that may have even a harder life uh, than you've ever had. So uh, instead of one, I did two that year. The next year, we did five. And these were all done anonymously. So, you know, what I wanted to do at that time was to do it anonymously because um, I didn't want them to owe me uh, necessarily or know who the philanthrop philanthropist was. Um, uh, so I was thinking very pure at that time. So that's how I got started. Uh, and uh, philanthropy for people that have done it, um, is, um, is contagious. Um, it's, uh, you know, once you, um, uh, uh, once you, um, uh, get used to it, uh, it's hard not to do it. Um, uh, well, one way you, it's, it, it's, one way you can stop is when you, you know, you don't have any more money. So, but you know, as long as you have something to, but but then you can also uh, do your time. Uh, uh, so it's it's not just about money. But but that's how I started. Uh, and then as I uh, it, as as I, you know, became had a lot more money, then I decided to create a foundation, and uh, give as much away as I could comfortably can. And that's how I started Messiah Foundation. I think it was in year 2001 uh, when I decided, you know, to stop work and, you know, uh, uh, do some of the community services. <clears throat> right. And what, so what, what kinds of, um, what kinds of, uh, well, first of all, you, you have a, a sort of particular philosophy, right, to the, to the foundation. Yes. Uh, maybe you can tell me about that. So. <clears throat> Well, we coined this phrase called uh, venture philanthropy. Uh, it, what, what it means is that we apply the same uh, business investment methods to uh, make philanthropic investment. We actually write that we don't give gifts. We make philanthropic investments. And when you make an investment, you're looking for three different attributes. So we are looking for good management that could be good stewardess of our uh, money. We're looking for broad public benefit, that is the pro product of that activity or that management impacts as many as uh, people as possible. And then we are looking for 
transformational or innovational um, uh, ideas, things that has not been done before so that we can open a new possibility or a new door. So that is our philosophy uh, of uh, uh, investments. Uh, we we uh, try as much as possible uh, uh, not to, to give just uh, unrestricted gifts. So what, what kinds of things um, have you ended up investing in, and, and how do you select those? Yeah. Well, um, mostly it has been in education, and uh, so from a broad categories, I, we, we've invested in education, we've invested in um, uh, health and uh, uh, health-related uh, uh, areas, and we've invested in uh, arts and culture. Uh, if you want me to be uh, more specific, uh, examples are um, uh, Portland State University, their engineering uh, uh, school was in many different buildings, and uh, they uh, uh, never had a, uh, a, you know, a, a place of, um, a, a place called an engineering school. Uh, it was all over the place. We helped them build a very large facility, and now uh, they have created uh, a, uh, a, a a real uh, great program. Uh, uh, you know, their computer science is probably one of the best in the Northwest, and um, uh, and they've doubled their uh, faculty, uh, which they could never do because they didn't have enough uh, space, and uh, they they've tripled uh, their uh, st student enrollment. Um, uh, in the past uh, uh, 15 years. I, I mean, these are all possible because, uh, you know, they could put this all together uh, and serve the city of Portland. Um, we also helped uh, at Portland State, the math department, where I, I received a degree. Um, they uh, needed to retransform themselves um, uh, into more of an applied um, a math department rather than uh, they didn't have a focus uh, before so uh, you know each of their professors had their own expertise and uh, so so we provided um, an opportunity for them to uh, scale up faculties in applied and statistics uh, and, and now that is benefiting uh, them because they are making uh, uh, relationships with Oregon Health Sciences uh, and also the engineering and other uh, uh, companies that are around them because now uh, they have professors that can get engaged uh, into research that are applicable uh, in those fields. Um, uh, at MIT, uh, the main reason for the gift was increasing the student undergraduate population. Uh, by 10 percent. Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily about the building or a dorm. Uh, it was because the dorm was needed uh, to uh, add another 400 uh, students. And, um, and, and frankly, uh, the, the, the benefit of something like that is, uh, is, is in billions. Uh, so our modest investment or our modest help uh, in MIT's uh, increasing student population uh, by by 10 percent uh, will lead to uh, having 100 more uh, MIT degrees on a yearly basis. So over 10 years, uh, you're going to have a thousand more MIT degree professionals. Out of these 1,000, you will generate billions of dollars of economic opportunity, uh, whereas uh, you may not uh, if you don't have that capacity. So, uh, so, so I think that that's another uh, uh, example of transformational opportunity, which we, we were blessed that, you know, we could play a part uh, in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously great management is here, uh, broad public benefit for another thousand uh, MIT graduates. 
and uh, you know an ability to uh, contribute to something that was missing uh, to create this opportunity. Uh, so, so these are some of the examples of what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so the 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 gift to MIT in particular. Um, I mean, I know it it went uh, into renovating um, what was Ashdown House. Yes. Um, um, how did it? How did it? Maybe you can tell me a little more. How did it uh, help expand the student body? Was it simply, uh, you know, just making a place for people? Yeah. Well, yeah. MIT didn't didn't have enough room. Uh, so MIT, uh, I, I think they decided. By the way, I, I I stayed my first week or two at Ashton House when I came to Boston. So I had a personal affinity to that place. So what was uh, it like then? <laughs> it was uh, it was run down. <laughs> Uh, uh, I mean, it's 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 an old building, uh, or it it was an old building. But but you know, uh, uh, when I when they renovated it and I went and saw it, uh, it's beautiful. Uh, it's it's like a nice hotel. Uh, but but going back, um, uh, you know, uh, you were saying. Uh, uh, I lost my. Yeah point. yeah. Sort of. Well, I was sort of wondering. Um, uh, how that helped um, increase the student body. Um, well, MIT uh, had, uh, there were a few instances at MIT that, you know, um, the administration decided that all the undergrads uh, and definitely all freshmen uh, must remain on campus. So uh, uh, because of campus capacity, uh, MIT actually used to have 4,500 undergraduate students. They had to scale that down so uh, they can fit them all on campus. And, and that was a problem. Uh, uh, and, and Ashdown, if you recall, was a graduate dormitory. So when they built graduate dorms, uh, they tried to uh, then allocate and you know, bring the capacity online for undergrads. But that renovation was stuck because, uh, uh, you know, again, we, we are talking about 2008, 2009, and 2010, uh, the financial crisis. Uh, and, uh, and, and they uh, did not know what to do. Uh, and so the renovation stopped. And, um, uh, and like I said, this was like an opportunity um, of a lifetime for us to, uh, uh, you know, be able to, um, to help out. Um, yeah, what was it? What was it like to? Um, well, I mean, you've, you've you've given back so much to these places that um, that were very crucial in your own development yes. and career. Uh, yeah, I mean, what what is that like? Well, uh, I think it's natural that you um, um, you stood on somebody else's shoulder, and you want to go back to those shoulders uh, and make sure that others can stand on those shoulders also. So um, so I, we, we have affinity to the places that I was helped. And, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's natural to go back and uh, make sure that you pay back uh, uh, to the places that helped you out. So, um, uh, uh, but, but, you know, we have helped other schools that has, you know, I didn't have any personal connection. Um, I think even in Lawrence High School, um, like I said, I, to this date, I have not stepped on the, um, in, in Lawrence High School. Uh, I don't know even where they are. Um, but I think... Uh, Year to date, we've given uh, about 300 uh, scholarships uh, in the past 15 years or past 17 years. So we've, we've kept going. Uh, and instead of one scholarship for one year, uh, we take now 25 um, every year. Um, and then we follow them all four years. So uh, it started from a modest level, um, and, uh, but it has scaled up 
uh, you know, throughout the times. Uh, and, and like I said, I had no affinity. I don't even know where Lawrence High School is. But, uh, 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 but I think the results are good. Um, uh, they've, they've had three or four students admitted to MIT already. Um, I don't know if how many they had in their history before. They've had a few that have gone to Harvard. They have gone uh, to Brown. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so it's it, it has been you know uh, helpful for them, and frankly, uh, very helpful and fulfilling for us. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful. Uh, that's uh, that's great. Yeah, and. Um, you, you mentioned sort of uh, art and culture kinds of yeah. investments. What, what maybe you can tell me about those? So uh, let's see. Uh, examples are uh, we created a center for Persian studies uh, at UCI. I named it after a um, Presbyterian um, reverend who came to Iran a long time ago uh, and built uh, the high school that I went to, uh, which was, uh, at, at, at the time, it was the best high school in Tehran, uh, competitive to get into. And, uh, and, and it was done, uh, or it was built by uh, uh, this reverend, uh, Samuel Jordan. And, uh, and, and I thought that, you know, uh, uh, Iranian Americans, um, uh, being in diaspora, uh, they need a way to connect uh, to their heritage and cultures because uh, as, you know, kids are born here and uh, they, uh, if, if there is no center or sources available for them to reconnect back to their culture, um, they uh, uh, would probably miss something uh, about the fact that they came from someplace, or their ancestors came from someplace, but but they don't have an opportunity to um, uh, to to have that um, a, you know identification uh, a, in a tangible way. Uh, I mean, you can learn over the internet and all that, but 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 it's different than you know when you um, group them together and then they can actually talk and you know they uh, share uh, time and resources and classes together. Uh, again, uh, uh, how did that qualify those venture philanthropy? Well, uh, it's the only per center for Persian studies um, uh, that uh, is self-standing and independent. Um, none was available uh, in UCI uh, or in Orange County. And uh, UCI is, uh, has very capable uh, uh, you know, management, and uh, they were very open uh, to this idea. So, so that was an opportunity that we could do that in 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 a cultural standpoint. <clears throat> yeah, that's 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 great too. That's, and I think I read um, well that's something about at the Metropolitan Museum too. Is that did I read about that? Uh? We've we've given well. We, We've written a lot of checks, so uh, uh, yes. So, so, so there is a list of museums and you know places that uh, hospitals that we have helped. Uh, we've uh, you know um, uh, uh, churches. Uh, 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 so, uh, but, but, but those are not necessarily major investments. Uh, you know that we, um, uh, but, but we. Um, on a yearly basis, uh, we we do uh, uh, donate some uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 some of the good causes that um, uh, we might have some affinity to. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, yeah. And I think did I read that um, there is sort of a, a film production <laughs> entity? Is that right? That uh, that you're part of now, or? Uh, well, um, I own a cinema. Is that uh, 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 or uh, or more of the? Uh, well, I mean, tell me about that. But I, I I guess I thought I had read something about, but maybe it was incorrect. But about uh, uh, 
you know, a film production projects or something like that? Uh, well, yeah, we, 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 we have given money uh, to, to, um, uh, to produce uh, documentaries uh, in the past, uh, uh, mainly humanitarian uh, documentaries that can basically uh, document uh, maybe an earthquake or uh, uh, and, and projects like that. Like I said, uh, we, we, we've given, um, you know, smaller amounts to a lot of different places. Uh, so, you know, yes, we, we have been instrumental in making some of the movie documentaries. All right. And, and you say you, you, you have a cinema, is that right? But I, I do own a cinema, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, 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 but but that's that's just a business venture, yeah. Right, yeah. right. No, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Um, what, what's uh, what's it like on the um, uh, you know serving on the on the MIT Corporation? Uh, you know, are there what, what are the goals? Oh there? yeah. So, well, like I said, uh, you know, uh, like the first date. Uh, day that I came to MIT, uh, that y you think you're averaging up with everybody else uh, because everybody else is so much smarter. Uh, now, when you go to the corporation board, and I serve on a lot of different boards, uh, then you really average up with these guys uh, because everybody is so super duper smart. So uh, just to be sitting amongst them uh, and listening to them uh, is, uh, is a privilege. Uh, is, uh, I, I've learned uh, so much just, you know, uh, uh, just, just to sit with them. Uh, uh, so what is it like, uh, uh, you know, to sit amongst some of these most accomplished people uh, around? Uh, it, it's great. Uh, you learn a lot. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I was interested um, to read about uh, uh, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. Maybe you yeah. can tell me about that and how that came about, what that meant. Well, I, I was, uh, I guess, uh, Ellis Island Medal of Honor is a um, medal that they give to immigrants that have certain amount of, I guess, humanitarian uh, distinction in addition to their accomplishments. And every year they give a hundred of these to uh, different individuals from different nationalities. Uh, so it's, it's more for immigrants of different kinds, whether you're Irish or German or Iranian or, uh, you know, Mexican. Uh, so it, it, there is a, about a hundred of them that is given every year. And I was a recipient of one of them. Uh, and I forgot when it was. Was it 2007 or uh, one of the years uh, that, uh, you know, they were giving this. Uh, I was honored to receive one. Um, yeah. No, it's, it's a, that's a great honor. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. was fun. That was the first time that I went to Ellis Island. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really an, a, a fun place to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering. Um, um, uh, you know, I mean, what, where, what, what do you attribute, you know, sort of your success to? I mean, it seems like you, you know, you've had a fascinating path, and you've taken a lot of different uh, uh, routes and, and and risks and things. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, where do you, <laughs> what do you, what do you ascribe it to? Do you think? Uh, so what do I? What have I learned about you well, know what? I'm what, wondering sort of what, what you attribute your success to. I mean, is it is it uh, 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 you know education and opportunity or you know luck yeah. or I don't know. I mean, it's probably a combination of things. Well, luck is part of it. You know, I I, I don't deny that fact. Um, but if I want to like uh, distill what I have learned uh, philosophically, I would say you should work hard in a dedicated way. And you should have a good heart. With these two combinations, it's hard not to win. Uh, I think these two, uh, if they are aligned well, 
will make anybody successful. And that's what I've learned. Uh, uh, and, and that is what I try to, um, to do going forward. Um, but, you know, uh, a lot of people work very hard. But I think that hard thing uh, gets in the way sometimes. Um, you know, uh, uh, you, uh, when, when your heart is good and purified and you work very hard, uh, I think you will succeed. But, but tell me a little more, you mean it gets in the way, how so? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to, uh, not to talk about it for a very long time, but, but I think, you know, the, uh, uh, what I essentially mean is uh, uh, if you have purity of purpose, and that purpose is good, uh, even if you, uh, 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 you know, even if it is hard or if there is high risks of failure, you still will have confidence enough to pursue it. But if there is no nobility and the purpose for something that is not as pure or good, then you may always want to hedge um, for the risk of failure. Does that make sense? I think so. I think so. I think there's a lot in that. Yeah. 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 Um, what, um, uh, you know, just on a sort of a different topic, I mean, do you have free time? And what do you do with your free yeah, time if you well, have any? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I've had a free time for a long time. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, so I live in a beautiful area. I live on near the beach. And uh, uh, I enjoy going on a boat uh, in the ocean. Um, uh, I... Um, I'm a farm owner, uh, so uh, uh, we enjoy, you know, uh, sometimes uh, growing crops and, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, I've got young kids, so a lot of my free time is dedicated uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to them. So, uh, uh, and, and frankly, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm of the personality that um, I don't enjoy sitting and doing nothing. Like, I, I, I don't necessarily want to have a free time that is really free. Uh, as long as my time can be used in a way that I enjoy it, uh, I think I'm happy. Uh, and I don't want it to be just free. Right, right. What, um, are there, are there, Things that you're um, undertaking now or, or embarking on that uh, you're particularly excited about that you can talk about? Or? Well, the things that I'm excited about right now is we are starting to uh, invest in um, very small companies again. And, and that's what I like to do in the next 10 years, uh, to go back to um, the very smallest of the companies, and I'm talking about just concept companies uh, that I like to be involved in uh, in the next 10 years. Uh, and that is what drives me going forward. Getting the help, the startups, getting them going. Getting, so, you know, giving myself uh, uh, to help some of the uh, really, you know, startups that may need help. Uh, I think that is something that I'll be excited about over the next 10 years. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, we've covered so much wonderful stuff. It's been great talking with you. I, yeah. I just want to look and make sure, you know, see if there's anything that I missed. But is there anything that that you uh, wanted to touch on that we haven't talked about? Well, I think, uh, uh, obviously, I'm, um, uh, you know, uh, Honored to be uh, uh, involved at MIT. Uh, this is truly the greatest institution in science and technology uh, ever created. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I had the honor and opportunity to uh, somehow be admitted uh, and somehow to be here. Uh, uh,
Well, thanks so much for talking with us. You're welcome. It was fun. Thank you.